Welcome to the Provoke and Inspire podcast. Thank you, Ben. Closing your eyes, David. What's wrong with closing my eyes? I don't know. So what? Ah, I keep hitting the same button. Yeah, Let's yeah, just, yeah. Can we just start the podcast? Oh, yeah. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Provoke and Inspire podcast, learning how to follow Jesus in a post-Christian culture. This is episode two, together in person after many years. We had a lot of infighting, you know. There were egos. There was yeah. drama. That was when that was when Chad still had the unibrow. Mm. I also think of the mm. anytime I hear the word infighting, it reminds me of the word inbreeding, which is awkward. It is awkward. We, like a band, have had many breakups and get back togethers, and um, we've had many tours that are the final tour. Yes. but yes. we just keep doing a final tour. I would say the breakthrough was when David got his own stylist. It was yes. like, I'm, he was, I'm sick of sharing his brow guy. But that's when people kept thinking he was a woman after that moment. That's, no, that's true. Right. So there's the corollary that let's just make that the poll question. Yeah. Does David still look like a woman? Yeah, you've got and a, what is a woman? You've got to compromise somewhere in yeah. between. Like yeah. you, looking good and being confused with a woman. Right. Somewhere in between. There's a fine balance and many of us mm -hmm. fail to find it. This podcast is part of Steiger. I'm sorry, Aaron. Uh... <laughs> this what? podcast I'm is not... Planet Steiger. I'm sorry, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's yeah. a great line. That is a great uh, line. Keep that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This podcast... Add that as a button, please. I'm sorry, Aaron. <laughs> and yet, without us, we'd be a wet pillow. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right. This. <laughs> you know. You what? No, I don't know. This is this is not a random story, but it. You don't get to pre-random rant. First of all, can we get that? You don't want to you, ran. You don't want to. You don't want to listen to like anything because can you start singing the lyrics? Yeah, you know, yeah, that's what got so me on. Like, it's raining. Men. So gonna I got a, you know, I got a turntable so that I would no, be girls. Just water. We're not gonna but. take it. I, I got a turntable. Yeah, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Because that's cool. I want it's you in my room. Have a turntable. Yeah, out. yeah. That nowadays it is. It's back. And, yeah, and so anyway, and and my sister got me the Bob Dylan's greatest hits. This mm -hmm. is your random story, by the no, way. Yeah. Yes, it is. And so then. Uh, one of the songs on there is Rainy, the jump. Rainy Day Woman. You know that song? <laughs> yeah, Pass yeah. the job. No, sing it. Yeah. On sing it. Everybody, everybody must get stoned. Oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my favorite song. walking down the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stone you when you're trying to be so sweet. The stone, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just, <laughs> everybody <laughs> wants to Stone you when you're trying to be at home. The stone you when you're all alone. <laughs> oh, I could not wow. be so. Yeah, we got it. We got it. This is good. This is 100% your random story. So. The I'm views like, are going up right so now. So I'm, yeah, I'm listening are. to this, you know, everybody must get stoned. And when I listen to a song, it just, the lyrics get implanted oh, yeah. in my brain. And then they'll go on repeat. Yeah, I have the same and problem again. Yeah. And it's terrible because like if you're going to speak in a church. <laughs> <laughs> and you just look at you the know, pastor and, like, and that song comes into your head. Stone you when you're trying to be so good. They'll stone you just like they said they would. So. This, so is I'm this like, assuming that you've, you, you've broken out into song no, randomly but I'm while like, speaking? Because no, but I, for I'm just all, all of our sakes, get, I hope that's not I'm true. I'm trying <laughs> to get that lyrics out of my head. You know what's going on that? And, but, I can see, it reminds me of Luke, because Luke's like, it doesn't really matter what you listen to. It's all good. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll listen to Rainy Day Woman and see how you feel. See, well, I gave you, see, I gave you some. Because he always is saying. I gave you some more oh, freedom. Music doesn't affect you. No, because he's always, Luke is always like. We're talking about like the movies yes. you watch or the music. Yeah, and he's well, like, it doesn't, it doesn't make matter. any difference. Yeah, it's, it has no influence that on is you. My standing. Why are you being making? And it, it, rainy day woman is a great example of why yes. music influences you because the whole time I'm like, you know, everybody must get stoned, and it I'm going, that's probably you. not good. I do imagine David standing in a church getting ready to preach. Right, right. And he's in his in his head. Yeah, yeah. There's a song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's not good. It's not. It's not. Good. Lord, I get Lord, you the right I repent. <laughs> I think. I'm sorry. I think that's that. That it's kind of a good. That's a good side to that. Yeah. yeah so you're, yeah. you're welcome. That was a wonderful. <laughs> welcome. I don't know what that means. I gave you some yeah, some. Story. That was you know, great. Freedom. Some great freedom. random story. The moral freedom of the to story listen is to Bob Dylan. I will stand by the freedom to listen to Bob Dylan. Yeah. Fair no, enough. No. So you're saying it's cool then if you get that. That song in, stuck in your head oh, all yeah. the time, everyone must get stoned. It and, makes church yeah. a lot more interesting. <laughs> wow, there's something for the Whoa. folder <laughs> that we were talking about, the old uh, blackmail folder that, that right. producer I Steve made it. I made yeah, it to where, the folder. Where's that folder? And no, why, why, aren't, why aren't those buttons? Okay, yeah. then. <laughs> when we have to burn it all down, that's when those buttons come out. Uh, all right, set list for today. We just had David's random story, thankfully. And, that wasn't uh, it. Yes, it was. That was it. 
Uh, so David's Ram story, I hope you enjoyed it, or we're getting a snack whilst it was happening, as the UKs would say. Well, especially when with the song, it makes you want it. You yeah, know, want yeah. Okay, then uh, next what we have is Punching Through the Awkward with Chad Ocho Cinco Johnson. Uh, I you, would say you're the most popular Chad Johnson now, you know? You the, I am kinda, the most popular Chad Johnson in my own head, that you is You said for that sure. kind of pensively. Yeah. There's nothing pensive about it. Uh, and then for the main topic, we're going to be talking about the Red Hand Files. Uh, actor and musician Nick Cave, yes, the Nick Cave, who has an, a great song with a similar title to that, right. the Red Hand, of Bad really Seeds cool fame song. and movies and and mm -hmm. other such things. Uh, he started a online blog, uh, as opposed to all those non-online blogs that are circulating <laughs> amongst the youths as we speak. You mean the ones that are handwritten? <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a, like a pile of handwritten really, notes. Really. Yeah, read yes. my blog. Well, what do you read like? My blog. Well, let's just say for the average person out there, that might be more effective than your three three uh, entry blog that your grandma read twice. Mm -hmm. Before um, the before there were blogs, there were zines. Do you remember these? I used to have a zine yeah. in my yeah. high school. See? I used yeah. to put them out on everybody's table. That was what table. you did. I would go into school before everybody arrived early. And I put my zine on everybody's what table. Was, what was your zine about? What was it, it was, called? It was like against capitalism. And it was <laughs> like, I put like, a perfect zine. Yeah, yeah, it was a political thing. But then nice. I put the gospel into it. Ah, and I left it on a table. That's how, and that's how I met Dallas Jenkins from The Chosen. There's yeah. a zine oh, called, wow. a, called Forehead. So the article about Pulp Fiction was in a zine? Called yeah. Forehead. Yeah. Called oh, Forehead. Interesting. Yeah. And he really did that's call all, him out. That all happened, yeah. Was, yeah. By and the then, way, by the way, last night, we had we told everybody in the last episode, but if you didn't listen to this other episode we've just recorded, last time we had this banquet, the Saga Banquet, and we had We need a better name for it. Dallas, we do. We had Dallas Jenkins on screen saying telling that story about yeah, when David cool. challenged him on that article. It was really cool. And he was saying, Guys, you gotta support Steiger. It was really cool. And he and he was saying that he really appreciated that you liked the chosen as well. And as, I just thought that I was loved awesome. how Brian Headwelt mm -hmm. said that that we were selfish. Steiger was selfish. Yeah, yeah. That was great. And he corrected himself. <laughs> yeah, he did. So Steiger, right. you're not selfish, you're <laughs> yeah, selfless. Yeah, yeah. Hold yeah. up, we're gonna come up with a new name right now. Okay. I'm, one at a time, you're just gonna say the first thing that comes to your mind. I don't want All you to right. think about it until I just point to you. Ready, go. Steiger trending. About what? Potty poo. Oh, I didn't have one. All right, you're all oh, suck. <laughs> I had no yeah, idea what yours. Wins. I'm marginally lean towards about what? Okay, but about I have what? an idea. Steiger, I'm gonna have to edit what? all that out. We had an idea last night, though. Okay, because this whole I've never seen this whole banquet culture thing. I don't that like you guys banquet. Have. The name yeah. banquet. But there's a culture for it in the U.S. Stop right? Saying that <clears throat> a lot of organizations do these for the non-U.S. Listeners, thank you for being with us. There are many of you now. We're excited about that. But there's this culture in the U.S. where a lot of organizations do this big meeting where they invite all their friends and partners and they share about what's going on. And they, they don't want to share their food in England. It's like, oh, would no. you like a greasy sandwich? Yeah, we don't do banquets. We do afternoon teas instead. Um, and so, Zip it. So anyway, we have this banquet. Now, there's, there's supposed to be a dress code to this thing, right? So they, Steiger team decided the dress code's got to be sem, semi-formal, right? So I, don't, I don't know what that is. They explained it to me. I got a long uh, email, I think from Michelle or from somebody saying that this is what semi-formal is, yeah. right? And it was very interesting, but it, it wasn't quite a good fit for us, I felt, right? So yesterday when we were there, I was talking to some of the guys and we came up with this idea. We need to create a new dress code, which yes. is the Steiger dress code. And we set like, th these are the parameters. You're allowed to dress like this. And it's going to be like Vika from Kiev who has to set the dress code. Oh, nice. Two words. Right? Two nope. words. Okay. Sci-fi cowboy. Nice. You could do it that way. But imagine us getting all of our sponsors and partners and church words, people. Disco party banana. To turn up with some kind of high fashion thing. Everybody has to wear that. And if they come and they're not good enough, there's a <laughs> little out. corridor, a little room, <laughs> and you're like, uh, you, you come this way, sir. And you yeah. take them th this way. And then oh, you, okay. you, you spice it up, right? You put some chains on, put me. some stuff I'm in the That reminds me of in, in Amsterdam when the Rolling Stones were doing yeah, a video yeah. shoot. Okay. What, you yeah. know what I mean to tell no, us? No, okay, you can tell it. So they were playing at the Paradiso and you were supposed to go there. Paradiso's famous club in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the Rolling Stones were doing this video. So they'd go there, and if they thought you were attractive, you got to sit on the ground floor. And if you were unattractive, you had to go up in the balcony. Right. And this friend of mine went, he had to go up in the balcony behind 
a pillar, yeah. a column. Yes. Right. And David, to Ouch. this day, before NLM shows, still uses that, even though it's awkward. What do you mean, till this day? What are Put you talking the about? Behind All right, the we're going to do a picture. Attractive people in the front, <laughs> unattractive <laughs> people in the back. And everyone's going like, Ugh. <laughs> Why are they going, ooh? I don't want to be a bishop. Wouldn't it be man. cool if everybody in our banquet looked super rad? Like crazy rad? cool? <laughs> super rad? Wait, how what about you take it down, we... Donatello? Su Sheesh. <laughs> super rad? Did you just rad? finish pizza? What the heck was that? That would be tubular, dude. <laughs> What's in this coffee, guys? <laughs> super rad. Wouldn't that be cool if everyone was super oh, rad? Oh, man. That's a, <laughs> that's a right. keen idea, Luke. <laughs> A keen, a keen idea. That Why are there no sound no bites one. for this guy? I don't know. Keen. Other than this. <laughs> I didn't notice before there's a cricket in that. Yeah, I don't know what oh, that that's is. That's amazing. You were out in the wilderness when you were chuckling to yourself. Uh, let's go to the uh, punchy to the I awkward. think Luke's a little incont incontinent. <laughs> in incontinent? In. in <laughs> oh, my. Uh, do you even what? How did I? How do I say this without being humble? How did I learn so many words growing up? Um. All right. Let's go to Look punching at, through the awkward. He's shifting. Punching through the awkward with Chad Johnson. Punching through the awkward with Chad Johnson. I was just reminiscing right in between these two episodes that the last time I was a part of anything Steiger related would have been the spring of 2019 and it was Richmond, Virginia, which which I can recall a conversation with Tommy Green mm. late at night. He was one of the guests at this thing. And I said, hey, man, I know that you had an affair and the husband of the lady that you had the affair with killed himself. And I said, dude, I'm, I just want to, like, I know I can trust you. I, I, I've been a friend with you for a long time. I just feel like I need to relay this to someone. But I think my heart is turning towards another woman. And I've never been here before in this way. And I don't know what to do with it. So that was, that literally marked the last time I was at a Steiger event. Wow. And four and a half years ago. And most of what I had found up until that point was, my what I love most about praying was God's rapid fire responses. Like you're in pain in Jesus name, pain be gone. How do you feel? I don't have any pain anymore. Come on. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Or yeah. like, you know, whatever the, the thing is like, like quick answers. Mm -hmm. But here I am four and a half years later, having found myself from that event to now in a season where the prayers being answered have felt like they've just slowed down to a near turtle's pace, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, along the way. And yet it's this whole time has been a reminder of God's promises that he doesn't, he, there's that verse I'm not thinking of right now that he doesn't uh, revoke the gifts that he gives to his kids. It's something like that. Mm -hmm. And, and just being here is like, is like God's sweetness of like, Hey, I, I know you love quick answers, but there was a whole lot of stuff we had to get through. Wow. And so I, I am here now having watched God restore my marriage mm -hmm. of now 27 years, how my daughter went from hating me for the, the, broke, the way that I broke her heart as her dad, her father, the, her protector, her guide, her best friends, all, all that stuff to the dad who was a complete you know what, and did things that he shouldn't have done. And so now I've watched God restore our relationship to best friends again, to my son. Like they're just like wow. God has restored. And so it's funny that like, even though I am not the same passionate spiritual leader, Chad, that I was five years ago, I come to something like this and I wake up this morning and my dreams are like, of of like prophesying over people and mm. praying over people and preaching the gospel yeah. and so i guess i just want to encourage you guys that that's the power of steiger planting seeds in the lives of people all over the world including those of us inside that you know mm -hmm. the those of us seated here yeah. that sometimes need that seed that don't even know it and then four and a half years later it, it, you wake up one morning and steve's 
uh, blow up mattress, you know, <laughs> not in on Steve's blow up mattress. Not <laughs> you weren't inside of the yeah, mattress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, that would have been terrible. Yeah, That's weird. like when Luke was on a plane. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's weird. Doesn't work out very well. But I just uh, I don't know. I guess uh, as it, as it relates to my kind of punching through the awkward, the story I had in mind was my root beer chugging straight edge atheist friend alex that i have known for 23 years who has been to every single furnace fest and this year i just we just started talking and he said you know man it's interesting are you still a born again christian and i was wow. like i was like yeah man i am i said are you still a straight edge root beer chugging atheist <laughs> and he said yeah man i am and i said wow isn't that crazy that you and i for 23 years have somehow maintained friendship and respect and value, even though we're kind of on opposite ends. He said, you know, it's really interesting. My sister is a born again Christian. And, uh, and, and I said, wow, really? I didn't know that. I said, well, have you told her that you come to this thing every year that's, that was founded by a born again Christian? And he said, no, I haven't. I said, well, man, you should tell her that, mm-hmm. that we actually pray for you. And like, like this is not an accident. Yeah. And that God's doing something here. And he's like, man, I don't know what it is, but it's like, this whole thing is so weird and so crazy. And so I just, you know, once again, it's kind of like, we love the short answers. We love the quick answers. We love mm-hmm. the rapid fire answers. And we see those throughout scripture repeatedly, and we should expect those. But I think I've also come to appreciate and value and respect and, and acknowledge that there is sometimes a, a slower pace to the work God wants to do in our hearts, that uh, whether it's the 23 year friendship that still hasn't materialized into faith or, uh, you know, four and a half years of, of God working in my life that he's still here. He's still present and yeah, wow. still working. Yeah. That's so cool. That's a podcast right there. That is right there. That is. But mm. you know, we talked in the previous episode about one of our values being family and that's family, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. that, that's 100%. You know, I was, I, I'm often meditating on the idea of, of the impact the cross should have on my life and beyond, of course, saving me it should profoundly impact the way I view everybody else, right? Like how, how could I yeah. not view everyone else with profound grace and patience and mercy in light of what God daily does for me, mm. you know? And, and again, you could no more be out of this family than my own kids could be out of mine. That's how I feel about you, Chad. So, yeah. well, yeah, I, thanks. Um, and for us, it's super exciting to hear that. Cause of course, you know, we've walked with you over these years and, and, you know, continued having, you know, you took some time out and then you came back and we've been having these conversations and, you know, we've all been praying for you as well, Chad, to hear you be able to be here in person and to say that and to tell us how God has led you is so cool. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, it's wild because there was a time where the, the Latins, especially the Colombians, but the Latins were like part, you know, part of my kind of extended family. And there's only two languages that I learned how to curse very well in, (laughs) which is Spanish and Dutch. And now all the Dutch kids are showing up. So it's like, what in the world? The mission is getting filled with Dutch kids. I love the Dutch kids showing up. We need more of that. No, but that's, but, but to, to your point, Ben, the family thing is like, where else would God place me where, where there's a, a Dutch connection, a Latin connection, a like artistic connection a heart for God, evangelism, you know, mm. like all, it's, it's it, super rad. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. No. That's going to be my new you, thing. Now. You swirl those nunchucks <laughs> and you keep on living your best life. Uh, Chad, no, you rock. You, Chad. We love you. And the next five years are going to be even better. So we're, we're excited for, for the full emerging Chad. Like we want, we want to yes. see it all back, but we want to see it more than ever. Um, because you've, you've had it's an whole, impact on my life. whole nother level. Yeah, because yeah, it's like thanks. when you get a deeper understanding like that, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I believe God's going to use you powerfully, Chad. So yeah. it's awesome. Thanks. And there's, there are people who listen to this and have listened to this for years who that's them, right? Mm-hmm. You know, they, they've gone through similar peaks and valleys as we all do. So thanks for being vulnerable. That, that just such a powerful element of the show that we would be sorely missing in your absence. And, so. and refreshing to hear a story where you, you see God's healing and, yeah. and refreshing because too often we're hearing stories of, oh, oh well, that didn't go well and we didn't hear about that person again, you know, and like to see you like persisting, seeking God and pers- yeah. uh, pursuing the healing that he can do in our lives is a, as a, as a it is. witness we need to have. Yeah. yeah and, and speaking of a broken world, so as I teased at the beginning here, we're going to be talking about a blog, an online blog, The Red Hand Files. 
Um, Nick Cave, who I'll be honest, I don't really know or am very familiar with, though he's very famous from what I understand. I tried to listen to a few of his songs. I was like, it's it's very hashtag unique. not for me. It's, it's um, it is a unique sound. It's an acquired taste. Though. Yeah, but whatever. Nor here nor there. I don't think it's his music. It's more his philosophy. That yeah, he's a, he's clearly a very deep, interesting, unique. Dude. Yeah, and he's very... he starts he starts this this blog and. Uh, let me just read it to be clear here. The Red Hand Files began in September 2018 as a simple idea. This is from his own bio. A place where I would answer questions from my fans. Over the years, the Red Hand Files has burst the boundaries of its original concept to become a strange exercise in communal vul- vulnerability and transparency. Okay, So this is really cool. And he, he says in other places he doesn't monetize it. it, it he doesn't want it. He's, nobody else. He's not hired a staff to answer these questions. He's maintained his commitment to read and personally respond to all of these people and young people especially have flooded to this blog even though he's not a, like a young influencer um and and they ask him all these questions what, and, he's got to be in his 70s isn't he uh he was born in 57 so whatever okay. that is yeah um i want to focus on one letter well i would like to eventually comment on the general concept and why that's interesting um so let's start there luke why is this interesting talk talk just about how this how you react to this mm-hmm. idea of him starting this and why it's so popular. Well, for me, it reminded me of some of the stuff we do in the mission and that we pursue in the mission realm of like spiritual conversations, Bible studies for the non-religious. Because what we found is that people might not be ready to kind of come into a thing and in, come to a church or come to a program, but people are willing to and actually wanting just an open conversation. They want a space where They can say what they think, ask questions. I mean, that's how social media works, right? Everybody's sharing their own opinions. Um, But to create a space where we can talk about stuff we don't usually talk about, spiritual things, existential questions, deeper things. And so we found that in the mission, that that, that's an effective way to engage people. And here's an example of somebody from like that secular, or I don't know if he's an atheist, but atheistic perspective, saying, finding the same thing, saying, okay, I've, I'm opening a space here where we can just ask questions and talk about deeper things that are not usually talked about. And there's a spiritual hunger for it. That's what I see in that. Yeah, I was reminded of, of the song that we talked about as a mission a while back um, from her name, I can't remember, but we all have a hunger and that we watched. Florence and the Machine. Yeah, yeah Florence and the Machine. That, I mean, it's like we watched that music video and listened to the words of that song. And that's exactly what I thought when I started reading this blog is like, we all have a hunger and Nick is, is attempting to put himself out there, which is incredibly noble, different, not, not normal. Um, and so that was, yeah, first, first thing that came to mind. Yeah. And so I, in light of that, I just want to focus on one short letter because these are not always long letters. They're often just questions. And the gender of this person is not revealed, L, I guess in theory it's probably a girl, but who knows. L, she writes this uh, to him and then he responds. She writes, I'm going to go with she. I'm going to be bold. Is that a problem? Is that a risk? It's probably a risk. L wrote, uh, I am 20, a high school graduate in my gap year, and I find it pointless to pursue anything in this bizarre and temporary world that is so much against my values in every possible way. I believe I'm speaking for a generation here. I'm asking with the biggest admiration, what would you do? in my, our situation. And this person's from Germany, which is quite cool for some wow. reason. So, David, how would, well, first of all, let me, I mean, let me actually frame it like this, because I think, of course, we have a response to that question that will be very different than Nick's. Um, without giving it all away, essentially, Nick really gives this person two, a, quite a short, probably, I, I don't know, two, three hundred words response. And really, there's two things that he says. He says that we need to be humble and we need to be curious. Humble in the sense that, you know, you're going to encounter people who think differently than you. And so you should not automatically dismiss them, but embrace the conversation because you'll learn from them. And curious in the sense that you should always want to continue to learn and grow and be open minded. And, you know, in a rather poetic way, he says, if you're humble and you're curious, this world will seem a lot less strange. And I'm like, uh, okay. So, David, in light of that response, first of all, what do you think of Nick's response to, to L? Uh, and then, well, of course, we can talk about how we might actually respond to that. Well, I, I would, I'm very sympathetic to L because I think if you're any kind of thinker, you're going to come to that conclusion, right? Um, yeah. You know, so my mother is, is 90 years old, and she's you know, probably going to go to be with Jesus very soon. That's why I came back early to the States to spend time with her. And um, 
she's ready to go and she's had an amazing life and she's got a family that loves her. And so even though it's kind of, she even had kind of a, uh, she was kind of living in de- denial that she was really dying and she kind of faced that just yesterday. Wow. And, uh, but she says, okay, you know, I, I know this is what's happening and it's, it's, uh, I'm ready. And, and so I guess my point is what kind of hope is there if you're, if you're someone who really thinks about life? It, I think of these friends I have in Amsterdam who they were talking about how beautiful it was when their friend was dying because she was sitting in her living room with her cat changing the television stations you know, on her television and then she died. And I think, of course, Elle is going to come to this conclusion. And I think it's really, really great that Nick Cave wants to have a conversation with, about that. I just find that his answers, obviously, are not really going to bring much comfort. And how could he give any comfort, any comfort with that kind of worldview? And, and so, I don't know. I mean, I think yeah. it's really great that he's willing to talk about something deep. And he's that kind of guy, yeah. you know, that's what he's known for is that, you know, and a lot of his songs are, are that, are that way. Right. But I don't know how you face the world, actually, if you're a thinker today without right. God, I really don't. Well, you, you, there's so much packed into this very short little message that Al writes. Um, you know, the two things that really stood out to me is he says that, or she says that, you know, the world is bizarre and temporary. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, and, and to me, bizarre is interesting. Again, if it's, English is not the person's first language, you know, who, kn- who knows exactly what they meant by that. But I think bizarre makes sense, right? Because we're told kind of in pop culture, like, life is beautiful. Life is great. You know, everything's wonderful. Everything's going to be good. And, and yet you look at the world and it's rough. It's hard. It's war. It's suffering. It's anxiety. It's depression. And what are you supposed to make of that dichotomy? What are you supposed to make of this sort of, everything's fine, glossy veneer, and then the true reality that's right there beneath the surface. Mm. So I think bizarre is a perfect word. It's like, what am I, what, what is it with this bizarre world, right? And then, of course, temporary, because, you know, even the, even the fact that, that Elle would say it's temporary kind of, and say that in a negative way kind of um, reveals an idea that that's somehow wrong, right? Like, what's the point of all this? If it's just, it doesn't live up to its promises and it doesn't even last why am I even doing anything here? Mm. And to me, there's just so much honesty and such great insight into the, the consequences of, of secular humanism, right? Isn't, yeah. Wouldn't you feel that this is a perfect description in a lot of ways of the consequences of what happens when you believe that the world is what secular humanism says it is? Yeah, it is. And it's, it's realizing that that's how most people are thinking and feeling today. Yeah. It shows us how much we're missing opportunities that Nick Cave is proving exist here, right? Which is to have these conversations, um, people want to to talk about it. They want to ask these questions and hear and listen to answers. And we have an answer so different to Nick's. And yet we're not having, we're not putting ourselves enough in that space where we can offer those answers because we're coming at it from a different angle. We're not creating a space. Hey, come and share and talk. Let's hang out. Let's, I want to hear your story. I want to hear how you're feeling. And so we're, we're coming at it in, first of all, we're often coming at it inside our own bubble. And, and so there's no space people can't get in. And when we go out, we're just telling people what, what they need to, what we think they need to hear. And so that, that just proves a point. We need so much to create these opportunities so that we can have the chance to give answers that are so much more going to really, there's the truth. It's really going to answer the question, right? Well, I, I, I think one of the things I, problems I have is that I feel like many of people in the church don't give answers anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to uh, someone and they were talking about a subject they had discussed in their Sunday school class about fear. And so they had this conversation about it. Uh, and I said, so what's the application? Okay. How does, you know, how, what, how the Bible talks about fear. So how do you apply it to your own life? And they said, well, we're not, we don't, we were told that that's a personal thing. We don't give an application. Oh, wow. That's secular it, humanism getting into the church. That's, but that's not, that's more common than you think. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I, but I, I don't, 
I mean, again, this is just my own speculation here, but my feeling is that it's more that <clears throat> we have a, a faith in the West that you, you, you make the decision and then you do the program and you do the thing. You go to the church, you do the thing. But what I don't think we've really done a good job of is, is knowing how to wrestle with the deep questions that we even maybe have. We don't even right. really go there. And we certainly don't know how to answer the deep questions that are out there. And so when faced with someone outside of the church, we have our verses, I guess, that we can apply or we know literally how salvation works, but we haven't become students of culture. We don't know how to talk about but how not- time feels like an alien presence or how, you know, he says, L says, you know, this world is so much against my values, hmm. right? To me, what does that communicate? When I, right. if, I would, if I was on the streets talking to L and, and hmm. he or she said that to me, the thing that my mind would go to is values. Yeah. Like, why that, do you that would care be the about fir- values? That would be the first thing I would ask in response. Like, if somebody would say that, the first, in that conversation, the first thing I'd be wanting to know is like, I'd love to know what your values are. Like, please, exactly. you know, tell me what, what you believe in, what's important for you. Like, that's, a, that's how we need to start. Right. I, I think but so how problems. do we equip people for that? Because I'm, I'm not trying to come off like the expert here, but I've had a lot of these conversations. And because of my love of understanding culture and how to apply the gospel to it, I feel like my mind now jumps to those places and I go, mm. okay, cool. Values, morality. Yeah. Where does that come from? How yeah. do, what does that point to inside of you that I can then point back mm-hmm. to God? But I don't think it's as intuitive for everyone to do that. I think some of our failure to, well, again, first we got to create those spaces and we can talk about how to do that. But second of all, even knowing what to do in those spaces, how to ask good questions, how to be good listeners, and then how to identify the things that we can use to point people back to Jesus is a skill that I think maybe isn't as intuitive as, mm-hmm. as I can think it is given how much I live and breathe this life. How do we, how do we help equip people? Luke gave it away and uh, uh, <laughs> made it easy for us, which in my mind, and that was the same thing too. It's funny that we all arrived at the same conclusion. I was hoping I would be the super inspired one that I only found the nugget, you know, the values thing. I was like, Chad, you get inspired much like the winter Olympics (laughs) once every two years. And most people aren't paying attention. Yeah, it's true. (laughs) But that value, I was the first thing I, I thought of was she compares her values as in opposition to the world around her. So what not only what are i think it's asking the question of what are your values but then what are the values that contradict yours and are is that the christian church is that like something else like it it, it just it made me wonder like are we her anti values or are would would that be true to her or is it something else or just it, it felt to me like it would be almost impossible for nick cave or anyone to answer her question with any true depth until they understood what she meant by the the tension there with values um, but i think the only way you get to that is questions so yeah, yeah you brought that up but and i feel like often in the kind of realm we we function people uh don't understand you got to combine um the listening with the then offering answers. And, and we tend to just do one thing or the other. And we often right. talk about this in the mission. So it's like, if you, feel, you think like, okay, God has called us to be evangelists and to preach the truth to people, then we, we, we forget how to listen and how to have a conversation. But then there's this other extreme as well, in, often in the church where we're like, okay, you gotta have a great conversation and then you never really get to answering the question, no, you know, sharing the truth. In fact, last night, again, with the event we had, of course, one of the big things we're always emphasizing is how we're sharing the gospel. That's the point of what we're doing. We want people to know the truth about Jesus. But I had a conversation afterwards with one of the people in the audience, and she had done a master's in apologetics. And she was like, do you guys use apologetics? Because I think that's really important, you know, for what you're doing. And, and I think she kind of had the sense because of just what we'd portrayed more strongly um, that maybe we didn't. But I was then telling her afterwards, you know, no, it's, that's a crucial part of what we do. It's like central because we, we got to be starting. We talk about relational presence in the scene. We talk about spiritual conversations. We talk about listening to people so that we know how to answer. You've well, got to combine that. It's values relevance, exactly. which is exactly that. Well, yeah. and apolo- again, apologetics to me is just, knowing the do culture. you care enough about culture to communicate Jesus to them in a way that they can understand? In their language. Yeah. And asking good questions. That's right. apologetics. And that's where, to what you were saying, Chad, like when somebody shares something like that, 
It's like I've there are so many questions I need to ask that so, to understand that person. So am I the only one here that thinks that there's a lot of the church today yes. not speaking the truth, but just asking questions? I mean, I see that too. I mean, I see that. Ex- there's both sides, isn't there? It's like that you see both extremes. I think. I I don't. I, again, who, who amongst us can speak for the big C church? I don't know, but. No, I don't. I don't know where are you live in. Like, I think most churches I encounter, they they love Jesus. They're trying to study and understand the Bible. I think it's more that it's detached from regular interaction with real culture that will inevitably shape the way you communicate. When it just becomes insular head knowledge that's detached from action, then then the need for application becomes diminished. Right. I don't think there's no application. I just think. This stuff is not exercised in theory. It's exercised in reality. Of course. It'd be like you just go, you know, my son never goes on the ice to skate. He just goes into a room where they talk about skating and how important it is. It's like it becomes real on the ice when you fall and fail and have to learn and put it into practice and you have contact and other people interfering with you. That's when you go, okay, now I get how this works. And so for me, it's the biggest miss is is the the detachment from action but what you said that i think is so crucial is to not get into the imbalance either in either direction of either listening or truth <clears throat> because even in nick's response if you read it and again go check out the red hand files uh it's one of the top ones here but i don't know if you'll find it other than just typing l and i don't know bizarre and some of these keywords you, you should be able to find it um but his response of curiosity and humility is perfect to me because we live in a culture that praises or increasingly is praising community and openness, but it's not really into answers. Exactly. Right? And so we have a culture that's like, let's talk about mental health, but solutions? Exactly. Whoa, well, that's whoa, what whoa, counseling whoa. is now. It's not, this mm-hmm. is what you need to do so you'll feel better. It's how do you feel? And so what do you want to do? Right. So, so to your point, we need to become great listeners so that it shapes our ability to communicate, but that is not going to remove the confrontational element of the gospel. Because that's, all of us in this room... That's the point I'm poorly trying to make. Go for it. Make is it. that we need to, to intentionally want to give the truth at some point. Because I yeah. know people who will... They're asking questions for 20 years you know, with mm-hmm. somebody, their neighbor, and never yes. just tell them the truth. Right. And I can remember a festival that we were very involved in mm-hmm. beginning back mm-hmm. in Europe... I was and thinking the, whole, the same example. Yeah. And, and uh, dear friends, and we were working for years, and the whole point of the festival... Opening. What? Never mind. Carry on. And the whole point of the festival was to t- bring people to Jesus, but then it turned from, and I said, because it's got more and more farther away from that, telling the truth, and it was very relevant the way we shared Jesus, and, and but it was it came to, I said, isn't the point of this event to tell people who don't know Jesus who Jesus is. And he said, no, the point of this event is to have a conversation. And so maybe it's that I'm reacting to that. And Mm -hmm. I kind of see that in a lot of churches that are wanting to be relevant today, is that they they go to that extreme. And I think more than ever, people are wanting truth. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and a, right. yes, we need to listen. We need to be. We need to understand what the questions they're a, they're asking. But I don't know. I just That's feel it's, it's exactly right. People and they're like, stop talking between the lines and tell me exactly what you think. Exactly. They want authenticity. Exactly. Right. But the false dichotomy in that is that there isn't a whole lot of brokenheartedness and learning that goes into the direct way that you communicate the gospel. Mm-hmm. Because I, I, again, I get it. The Holy Spirit can work through anything, but. I don't want to have to get in the way either. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like I can communicate the gospel in a way that sucks. Of course. And, and but so I, like, yes. and so, and but yes, can not, the Holy Spirit use that? Sure. But no, I'm not like, yeah, but that's a, no, no, no. I'm just, that's why I said false dichotomy that you don't want to go in either direction. And I don't think for the majority of our listeners, they're attending emerging liberal churches where it's more about conversation than the gospel. I think that for our listeners, it's really more of a struggle of like, we got to create environments to get out there and do it. To, to, to actually experience what it's like to start presenting the gospel outside of the church with a friend, have them confront you with all these questions you don't know the answers to, going back, learning, studying, praying, coming back to them. And, and yeah, you can be honest. I mean, one thing I've been saying to people is, you know, you, you, you find that sphere of influence that God has called you to. You ask great questions to identify spiritual curiosities in their heart. And then you use your story to tell the cross. Hmm. 
that and and who can't do that yeah. doesn't matter if you're because i you know i give this illustration yeah. when i speak and then i kind of humorously say all right so i know what you're all thinking you're all gonna have to go out and start a rock band and they all laugh mm -hmm. and then i say no you you probably won't start a rock band but what you have is a story and i share an illustration where i'm talking to this girl about art and i'm telling her how i think art points to the ultimate artist and she's totally tracking with me and then she starts to get a little bit skeptical and then i say let me tell you about what God did in my life. And I just share the story, how God took me from dead to alive, how, how he's given me purpose, how he's inspired me as an artist, how he's forgiven me for the brokenness I can't seem to fix. And, and that didn't freak her out. It was my story. It was what God did yeah. in my life. Yeah. And so I think that's a very powerful, disarming and way to share the it, gospel. That is. That is a really good way. I also think that it's once you've asked those questions, getting to know that person, it does two things. It allow it first it makes the person feel welcomed into a conversation so they're actually wanting to hear what you think the second is you've understood more where they're at so you know okay this person is actually really open to god and they want to uh, know more or they're very against and they've got various barriers that i need to address it helps you understand where they're at well the next step after that is getting to the truth and it can be through sharing your story like hey this is how it works for me it can also be answering directly some of the points that l's making there it's like hey you feel like the world's bizarre i feel exactly the same way and i think it's bizarre because of this i think it's a fallen broken place i think that there is a lot of pain in this world and a lot of, and it's all centered around this selfishness that we have we're all just trying to strive for our own thing um you feel like this is an empty place it is because we've forgotten where we come from the most important thing about us that we were made by a loving god that's how i see the world and and you know and this is who god is this is who jesus is and he came and he became one of us and he died for us and and he loves you he knows you before you were born and just go straight into a clear you know this is who he is but here's what you don't realize Luke. Mm -hmm. People would want a transcript of what you just said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's what you don't that's realize. Right, yeah. What you don't realize is that mm -hmm. there is so much experience and anointing and gifting and practice and failure and success in how you are able to just instantly. I mean, right? So yeah, I've I've got a really cool story that relates to that. Okay, so we were at the Ser this Serbia event I've mentioned a few times now, um, and there was a group of uh, people from North America there. Okay, and so it's mostly like. Balkans, it doesn't matter where they were from, but they were not from the Balkan region. They were coming in and they were a ministry and it's not always great when that happens, but they're trying to take part in the event. And, uh, and they, they were, try, they, you know, you'd want them to resist it, but they're coming up and trying to say how they would do things, right? So we're Steiger there trying to lead the group of young people from the Balkans into going out onto the streets and sharing Jesus. And at one point I'm sitting with Michael, who's one of our young leaders in a mission. He's from Norway. He's Love a, Michael. like 22, 23 year old, passionate um, for Jesus and sharing the gospel in an amazing way. And he's just learning a lot of this now. Like he's been involved with this for not even a year. Um, well, yeah, just about a year. Um, so he's in that process of learning this right now. But it was so cool because this guy came over who's like in his 40s and was like, hey, um, I know you guys are trying to help people share the gospel and stuff, but I really think you need to tell them how to do it. Okay, because they, they, they just don't know how to do it. People are in the church, you know, we tell them to go out and share the gospel and we don't tell them how to do it. And I was like, okay, what do you mean by that? And he's like, well, let me show you this method that we use. And then he starts describing one of these methods, right? Oh, it's the three this or the four that or whatever it was. Yes. He's spending it like this. It's and the it's very, gospel trumpet. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, how the do I answer this lever. guy? I was like really struggling. I was like, how do I answer this guy? And Michael was just like, oh, you know what? This is what we do is we teach people that you just got to go out and listen to people and then you've got to learn how to respond to what they're saying and share your faith. And that will look different in each conversation. We want it to be very relational. We don't want to give people a ready-made answer that is going to go out like robots and repeat everywhere. We're trying to help people really go out and engage with people, really go out and listen and then be huh. bold and share the truth. And we're learning, of course, as we go along, but it's beautiful because it's like works different in every place and we have these values, it's relevance, we want to preach it I was just listening to it and I was like, wow, yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. This guy's been with us like for a year and he already knows it. He's totally got it. And he's the one who's got to be out there doing that and sharing the faith with young people. So when he finished, I was like, hey, that's exactly what Michael just said. So sorry, this is how we're doing it. And, you know, we got to. So it's it. I agree with you. People want that. 
And I guess the encouragement we need to give is like, don't just go for the easy, ready-made answer that you're going to try to give to everybody. No. Learn to just go and have a conversation, be unafraid to yeah. talk to people and to learn how to answer, how to share, yeah, from right. your story or just, I mean, and here's something I did say to the guy. I was like, I believe everybody who is a follower of Jesus knows the gospel. They don't need a ready-made explanation. Like if you've, if you've got a relationship with Jesus, you know how you got there, right? So go and, and talk about it and learn gradually how to explain that in a way that people can yeah. understand today. And, and Michael, you know, he's a fairly new believer in a sense. And you can feel that because it's so authentic and his story is so relevant. It's not, yeah. you know, from yester far. And I think that's a little bit of the problem with some people. You grow up your whole life in the church and... You, I, you, I I don't I think a lot of people who are in the church don't know how to explain anything about how they became a Christian. Mm -hmm. But why why would again? I we mean, could, we could go on so many tangents, and Chad literally has to leave to get on a plane fairly soon. Um, but why I don't understand why we think anything's intuitive, like mm -hmm. to communicate anything, especially something of that significance, of that spiritual importance. You know, every other natural area of life we recognize the need to try, fail, try, fail. You know, it's like, like the old, what's the old surgeon model? C1, what is that? C1, do one. But it's, one. Okay, it's a valid point. So then, then, then what, how would you guys deal with no, it? You're then? wrong then. It's a valid point. I, I get it. So it's not intuitive, <laughs> but we also don't want to give people ready-made no, formulas. But that's, so, but so what's the answer there? It's then? not a formula, but I think people need to be taught what the gospel is in the church. Okay. Because I think what Michael said to the guy is exactly what we're talking about. Now go do it. But he yeah. also has been taught about what the gospel is, about the cross and what the cross is. And, and yeah. otherwise, because I, I, I think it I, again, I'm with Luke on this. I don't think people don't, they conceptually understand the gospel. They just communicate it either using words that make no sense to anyone mm -hmm. or they've never done it. So why would they have any ability to communicate it well. Okay, I agree with you that, that people need to have a much, like, we've got to talk a lot more about the essence of what the is, cross what is, and in, who Jesus in, is more in the church, right? I mean, Chad, yeah. what do you think? Settle this debate amongst well, I mean, brothers. I could give a practical example of someone in our own mission who they were, <laughs> they were not seeing people come sure to Jesus about. after their yeah. shows, yeah. and they were frustrated by it. And I said, okay, this is going to seem really weird to you, but just say this, and then it'll, you'll be your own from your own experience but just start saying this word for word okay and it's weird and he started doing it all these people started coming to jesus in his yeah events yes and then he started to 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 learn how to articulate that from his own personal experience but he needed someone to give him kind of a an outline an not not like a yeah a method but also but to get him started in see that, that i do in, see happening in the mission a lot there's so what what i've seen work is we're filling people with examples and stories and and this happened and this is what I said. And so people that are in the mission, they're going to the Steiger Mission School and they're coming to all these events, they're hearing repeated examples of different ways of yeah, doing that. And then they find their own voice. So that I agree with. That's different to given a, a method that's like, yeah, use you just the read three this. circles and no, then they'll... No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to get real practical and then to give Chad a few minutes. Yeah, why doesn't Chad <laughs> ever get to say epilogue, anything? A soliloquy, a montage, if you will. Uh, I've, what's interesting is that we've all influenced each other, right? And, you know, a lot of how I communicate the gospels for years growing up hearing you communicate the gospel. Right. And same with you. We've influenced each other. But that hasn't been in a boardroom. That's been out doing it. And right. so, yeah, I, I think some, True. some teaching can be helpful, something, but... What I mean is it not just as simple as we need to be active evangelists in the church, and then I just attach myself to someone. It's like, hey, I'm going to talk to these next three people, and then you're going to do it, and it's going to yeah. probably be awkward, and you're probably going to fumble around. Exactly. The story you mentioned about the guy who started with the script and eventually got better. What's the key ingredient? He kept doing it and eventually got better. The problem is that this is a, I go on a missions trip once every six years, and I do this one evangelism thing. And then I don't do it again. Of course, why would we expect to be good at something we never do? It's true. Chad? Yeah. It's your moment, Chad. Chad, we, my moment. we're, I have we're to clear, waiting clear my with, throat. with uh, what is the job? With, with, with great eager, expectation. We're waiting, Chad. With, with it's up to you. Your arms. Everyone, I think it's going to be three super seconds rad. of absolute silence. Okay, go. Practice makes perfect. And I think that the church at large is desperate for a guide mm. 
oftentimes forgetting that the best, most personal guide is already inside of them and capable and willing to help them through whatever the situation is. But if you're right, uh, you're all right. If we stop and I, so I had gone from a season of incredible practice to the point where I, I wrote the book on how to step out. And then I uh, in, in experienced a season of mostly not stepping out. And so I know exactly what it feels like to go from practice makes perfect to I haven't done this or I don't do this very often anymore. And I feel really rusty. And if that's the, the way to put it, uh, I would guess that most of the church can relate heavily with where I've been more recently and can relate much less with where I was prior to the affair. And so that, that maybe that's part of why God's allowed me this, this, this period in time. But um, there, there's something that comes to mind that I heard from a guide that served me really well. And it was just start a sentence similar to how, you know, David shared and what Luke shared was just start whenever you see somebody, look them in the eyes and just say, I see you as the kind of person who, and then, and then fall back, let yourself fall back into the arms of the Holy Spirit and speak whatever comes out of your mouth to them. Mm. And that's like, it sounds so difficult because it's like, oh, but Step it's, of faith. yeah, but it's incredible how often it'd be like, I see you as a kind of person who, and then what comes next is like, has an incredible gift of hospice. And all of a sudden, crazy stuff starts coming. And it's like, mm. I had no knowledge of any of that. And Luke's seen this, we've all seen this kind of mm. stuff. So whether it's that specific, you know, mm. kind of tool, it's, it's all practicing ways of listening, ways of communicating. Way, but, you know, I think at the core, it starts with having a heart and a desire to see God touch someone's life. Yeah. And until you have that, <laughs> yeah, it's all just, matters. you know, like right. three, one, yeah. four, yeah. you and know, do right. this, do that sentence. Yeah. And, and like you just said, at the end of the day, if God is good and he's just and he wants to use your life, then from my reading of scripture, it doesn't say, you know, you're, you're, I'm the vine, you're the branch. As long as you listen to Chad, you will be fruitful. Right. Yeah. Right. It says remain in me. Right. It says, so my heart is broken for the lost and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And I respond to that by stepping out to try to share my faith. God's going to use it when it's great. God's going to use it when it's terrible. And I'm going to grow like crazy in that process. And your faith is going to be real in your yeah. life and alive. Ben, did you just refer to us all as yous? <laughs> oh, you guys want to go to KFC? I think, I think that Utes. came out. I do think A so little too. bit of his New Zealand background came yeah. out there. So. Hashtag nard. Just like you yep. just said. Shut it, nod. Mench. I remember uh, that. We're going to have to edit all that out. No, we're not. All right. Love you guys. Half as much as I will and twice as much as I should. <laughs> um, Bil Bilbo. Bilbo Baggins. No, that was yeah. positive, actually. That was a Bilbo Baggins. See, here's the thing you don't. Do here's the thing you probably such know. Such a nerd. Ben is such a nerd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and who's in charge of this little shindig? Yeah, uh, like my dad said, don't make fun of the nerds. You'll work for them one day. Nice. Um, <laughs> see what you just said about the whole start a sentence and not know where you're going. That's been my life. Yeah. I never know where this is going, but mm. boom, the words come out of the hopper, and yep. that's right, and brilliance emerges. Uh, that's it. I, I want to encourage you that you have got better, Ben, at kind of guiding your words. That's that's a quality of ha ha. I reject that. I like who I am, where I've been, and where I'm going. Yep. Uh, I love you. Leave us a rating and review because this is getting sad. Yeah, this it is. is. We, Come on, what is? We'd show love show us even something some. in Dutch. It's like I hope that was not swear <laughs> okay, because there are either. Netherlanders listening to this. <laughs> yeah, there, are. there are actually some conservative ones. <laughs> Three, uh -oh. two, one. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been just wonderful. Uh, we got to get Chad to the airport and to therapy. And uh, <laughs> when that's all done, we'll come back in five years. We'll do this again. Yeah. Rock and roll. Yeah, that's Rock right. And roll. All right. Love y'all. Thanks for listening. Share it. Peace.